with their views on particular issues facing the neighborhood. Questions were submitted by community members, you all, to an online Google form. We have picked most but not all of these questions and edited them for length and clarity. These questions have not been shared with any of the candidates, so you'll be hearing their off-the-cuff responses tonight. <laughs> each candidate will have a two-minute opening statement and then one minute to answer each question. We considered giving the candidates more time uh, for their answers, but we did the math, and that would result in fewer questions from you all. So we opted for more questions from you all, of course. But it will feel rapid fire for both you and them, I think. So, um, so a couple of house rules, and then we'll get rolling. So please listen and respect the candidates who are in front of you tonight. Um, they're here by choice to seek a position of public service. Please no clapping or cheering. Uh, it takes up time and it can drown out the answers of other candidates. Please do not create noise that would affect another person's ability to hear. Uh, it's an informational event, not a political rally. And then time limits are visible to the candidates and the questioner via, via that screen, and it will be enforced by the questioner. No smoking or drinking in the Guild Theater, at least not tonight. And then, last but not least, please do silence your phones. Um, if you're a Facebook user, however, please feel free to check in at this Facebook event if you would like to, by navigating the Facebook event on your phone. Uh, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to OPNA board member and South Oak Park community leader, Michael Blair, to ask the first set of questions. So he can have some questions. All right, again, welcome everybody. Um, so at these, at our board meetings for OPNA, uh, I'm the timekeeper, so I'm just letting you all know. There's some times of these questions, and I'm not afraid of y'all. I will come grab the mic, okay? I don't play, right? We're gonna give you two minutes for this first round of questions, and then once we do that, then we're gonna start off more questions, and then we'll all be at one minute each, okay? So think concisely, right? If you're long-winded, you're in trouble tonight. Let me get you. <laughs> all right, so let's do this. I want to jump right into it so we can uh, save time to have uh, time for you all to respond. So this first question, again, two minutes. This is more of an opening statement. I'll start right here and then kind of work my way through. So this question, please provide some opening remarks about your background and why you are interested in running for to represent Oak Park oh, and the rest of District 5, too. Right. Uh, so we're going to start off with Miss Kimberly. Kimberly, two minutes. Go for it. Thank you for having me. My name is Kimberly So I'm running for city council because I care about my community. Sacramento has a lot to offer, and I think we're plagued with violence and homelessness. I am a renter, and I have experienced unaffordable housing firsthand. Gentrification is forcing residents out of our neighborhoods and communities. It is increasing the homeless population and it's smashing dreams of home buying. We all want a safe city to live in, and I believe we need to invest in our youth. I need to I believe we need to pour resources into child care and youth programs. We need to remove the guns from the streets. I'm a survivor of domestic terrorism and I believe we need more resources in our communities to tackle our violence problem. I have served in the city of SAC by volunteering for For Our Friends Street Vets, providing vet services to the unhoused, low income, and places like harm reduction services. I don't think money should be the decision making in our it shouldn't be the force in our decision making for policies. I promise to put people over profit, have an open door policy, be available to my community, and serve you in the best way I can. All right, thank you, thank you. And everybody, I, I apologize, that's Kimberly So. I did not say her last name, so thank you so much, Kimberly. All right, so same question. We're gonna start the clock over at two minutes, and this one will go to Mr. Chris Baker. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Chris Baker, and the reason I want to run, I moved here in 1993, became a single dad, and the things that I've seen that went on was atrocious, whether it was education, whether it was in the community, and raised my son from 18 months old to a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. But when he was in school, he was characterized as being a statistic in the penal system, 
because of the trauma he went through, which is the reason I got custody of him. And I said, we got to change that. So I got involved in education advocacy back in 93, served on the uh, transition committee out of Washington, D.C. for three years, education department. And I just kept going. And then in the communities, when I take my exercise walk, I'm asking the, the business owners, well, why are you closing early? Why are you doing this? And they say they can't get any help. So I took it on myself to be part of some solutions, not the problems. Some of them stayed open. I worked to deal with some of the schools. They hired part-time kids to come in and stop Google, all those other things. And I've been going on and on and on. If you see the store up here, I collaborated with them to open that store, which was a food desert here. Open a store where I live, which was considered a food desert, and the two other outlying stores. And we're looking at two more locations in the north area that's considered a food desert. So my advocacy is believing that we can do it, take the chance to do it. Regardless if you're running for office, you're a community member, that's your community, take hold to it, walk it, get some ideas, get it done. And one of my mentors always told me, you can either be part of the problem or you can be part of the solution. I want to walk around and be part of the solution and the way I raise my son so he can take advantage of that and all you can take advantage of. That's why I want to run. Right. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate that. All right. Next up, Miss Katie Maple. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Katie Maple, and I'm also running for Sacramento City Council District Five. Um, when people ask me why I'm running, I always start with my personal story. Um, I was a 16-year-old runaway. I was someone who uh, left home, slept in my car, and put myself through school. First, my family to go to college, um, and I experienced a lot of uh, trials and tribulations trying to navigate the educational systems and the government systems. Uh, that were in front of me. Um, and I've always been a person where I have channeled my anxiety and energy into direct action. Um, and so after graduating, or eventually graduating from UC Davis, I went and worked uh, for a policy think tank, nonprofit called California Forward, where I did budget policy and elections and campaign finance reform, and really fell in love with uh, creating government systems that work better for people. Um, I then went and worked in the state legislature and have experience working with different viewpoints and people who do not agree on issues to get things done. Um, and then for the last three years of my career, I've worked in cities all across California, uh, navigating their systems and drafting ordinances that allow people to have uh, economic mobility uh, throughout the city. And so I take all of those experiences with me and I want to put them to action for you to create systems that work better uh, for Oak Park and for all communities in District 5. Um, and I'm also someone who cares deeply about my community. I served as the Vice President of the Oak Park Neighborhood Association along with these great folks here. And we helped create a program called Oak Park Cares, where I got my former employer to give $5,000 to create this program that has given grants out to our community, to our neighbors who, have, who were struggling during the pandemic. I also co-founded a nonprofit at the beginning of the pandemic called Sac Soup for Solidarity of Unhoused People, which provides mutual aid, including meals and survival for different folks on the street. I think we all need to work together, together to you know, address the big issues that we face, including homelessness, our housing crisis, um, gentrification, and, uh, and safety. And so I want to work together with you to do that, and uh, thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Last up for this question, Ms. Tamiko Hi. Hi, everybody. Thank you, um, Oak Park Association, for welcoming us today. And I just want to say thank you to all the people in the, in the room who are committed to community. Uh, my name is Tamiko Heim. I was born and raised in Sacramento. I am here because I love my city, truly. I am here to be a workhorse for my city. I spent the last 20 years of my life working as in the state service. I've been a budget analyst. I've been a human resources analyst. And for the last three years, I've been working in infrastructure planning. So my job is to make sure that things get planned for the city and the state. Um, also, for the last three years, I've been the Active Transportation Commissioner. I've been working around the city to ensure that we got bike lanes, we have crosswalks, we have sidewalks. And in District 5, those are some of the things that we are missing. We are missing a lot of sidewalks in some of the city, in a lot of District 5. So as I continue to work through the community, I, I look at these pathways that can enrich our community and help our community move forward. So again, why I want to be a part of this council and why I want to bring my talents to the city is because I lived here, I worked here, I loved here, and I raised my daughter here. And I just want to be an asset. 
Awesome, awesome. You, you wanted to clap, I know, but you can't, right? you can't do it. You can't do it. Uh, those were awesome responses. Thank you so much. I actually want to vote for all four of you right now. Uh, so, uh, so I appreciate that. These next questions are going to be one minute each. So they're going to be a little faster, right? Adrian said rapid fire. That's what it's going to be, rapid fire. Uh, this first question, we're going to start off with Chris, work our way that way, and then come back to Kimberly at the end. All right, so uh, this one is very timely. It's about policing. So this past weekend, Sacramento had its deadliest shooting in modern history. Do you believe that funding for law enforcement should be increased, stay the same, or be reduced from current levels? Chris, one minute. Well, I believe when we look at different areas to say if it needs to be increased, there's a possibility it does need to be increased depending on what the stats are in those areas, the crime, the statistics, decreased in areas that it doesn't need more policing, but I seriously believe right now in the state of frame of mind we're in now, certain areas, I would say it needs to be increased in areas that is needed. Because in my area, they're screaming about they need some more police, some of sen senior citizens. And I would advocate for that, but if it's not needed, then I wouldn't advocate for it. But I would say yes, in some areas it is needed. Great, thank you. All right, let's uh, take it to Katie. Sure. Uh, so I would say right now we currently have the highest police budget in Sacramento history. Um, and we have a very resourced police department. It's great because they're able to respond to crimes, including the tragedy that happened on Sunday. Um, I'm a proponent of making sure that our budget aligns with uh, the community needs and priorities, and also that our police budget aligns with the calls for service that they're getting. So, for example, if we know that we're getting 20% of our calls for service for mental health calls, or for homelessness, perhaps maybe the best person to send out is not a police officer, but might be someone with mental health background or social services. And so I'm really um, supportive of making sure that that budget is aligning. And we've seen this in other cities, like in Denver, for example, where they, they not only saw a reduction in, in crime and calls um, by aligning their budget with mental health resources and others, um, but they saw, uh, you know, basically their police department was able to more manage the cases that they had. So I would be supportive of that. Great, thank you for that. All right, and Tamiko, your response, please. So I think right now, instead of being reactionary to what happened, we need to pick up. We need to look at what's currently happening in the city. We have a lot of boots on the ground organizations that work in the city, and we need to resource them. We need to make sure that money is going into their pockets. We need to work with the Mr. Kings, the hood, um, healing of the hoods. We need to work with programs like that to ensure that they have a budget that can work alongside with the police to ensure that we are safe and the community is safe. That is what we need to focus on. We need to start working on a reactionary basis and start where we need to start. We also need to invest in kids. Kids need to have somewhere to go after school. They need to have programs. They need to keep them off the street. That is what we should be focusing on. Not on the police budget. We need to focus on how do we stop the next shooting from happening. Excellent, thank you. All right, and last, Ms. Kimberly. Uh, I think the police budget needs to be decreased, and I think I believe in preventative measures. I would like to see more money poured into organizations like St. Hope and our nonprofits that are providing services for our communities. I would like to see more resources poured into our youth. I came from Oakland. I have worked with youth programs in Oakland. We have reduced violence in Oakland. Right now, there's another rise in violence across the state, across the country. But I have seen positive results from investing in the youth, investing in the community. We have talented people in this community. If we give them a platform to showcase their talents, their skills, they could be stewards for our future and pass it on from generation to generation, but we must invest in the youth. So thank you. All right, so we are going to the next question, and it has to do with housing affordability. Like we really have that problem here in Sacramento, right? Uh, so this question, it says, based on US Census data, the percentage of owner-occupied residents in the Oak Park area dropped from 38% in 2019 meaning that renters have risen six to 62% of households. 
Many blame the real estate investors and speculators. How would you address this crisis? And with this one, we're gonna start with Katie. Sure, so I think one key component of this is, is actually tenant protections. We need to make sure that we're um, protecting renters and allowing them to stay in their homes. People who live in, in Oak Park in this community who've been here for 30, 40 years, they're, being a fit, they're what makes up the fabric of the community, the history, and unfortunately in recent years we've seen that more people are coming in and people are, are not able to stay here because of the, the rising cost of housing. Um, I'm very interested in looking at things like how can we help people stay in their homes, making it difficult for people to kick you out just because they want to you know, rent their house for a higher price or sell. Um, but also really interested in looking at ways that we can help people find pathways to home ownership. Um, buying a home was something I never thought I was going to be able to do. Um, I came from a very low income family and it was something that took me years and years and years of savings and I know that I had an incredible amount of privilege. And so how can we utilize maybe state and federal dollars that are left on the table at the city um, to help people come up with down payments because that's often the biggest barrier that people have. And I think uh, you know, being able to own a home is a, is a great pathway to generational wealth and I'd love to see more of that. Thank you. Ms. Tamiko. So, you stole some of my answers. But, <laughs> but I, 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 I totally believe in um, creating pathways to um, home ownership. I believe in providing assistance and incentives to individuals who need to stay in it, or, no, sorry, providing incentives for landlords to work with some people who have the voucher program providing assistance for people to own a home. I, when I bought my home, I received a grant. So I was able to do a down payment because I received a grant and I didn't have to pay that part portion back. So I do believe in educating individuals in the community to make sure that they know what they have available to them. And if we educate them and help them create their own pathway, if it's rent, if it's owning, just be able to um, provide those services to them that is what I see, and that's how I see if we could better the community in itself. Great, thank you. All right, now we go to Kimberly, your thoughts. I'm a renter. I've had a $600 rent increase in the last three years. At what point does it reach this point where I'm on the streets and it's a problem? So I think we need more tenant protections. I live in a single family house. They're not protected. I'm getting 10% rent increases. I believe we need more rent control. We need eviction protections and more subsidized, more better subsidized housing that is beneficial for both landlords and tenants. Thank and I can't say enough about affordable housing. Excellent, all right, thank you. All right, Mr. Chris, last one. I believe we all took each other's answers. Um, I believe in incentives with the uh, owners also and uh, programs for the tenants. Um, if the rent's going up phenomenally on certain areas, we got to find some type of incentive for those folks that's paying that rent and the owners and also eviction protection. But I'm fair, I'm open. We got to have the owners at the table too because they have a life to live and they have to pay bills. So we want to make sure we're fair all over. And there needs to be tough sanctions against evictions. I've seen a lot of evictions that was done wrong and people were put out of their homes with no help. We need to find some type of toughened strength in those communities to make sure those people were treated fair. And that's what I would look at. All right, thank you. All right, now we're going to my last and final question. And this one is about small business. This one will start with Ms. Tamiko. And the question is, what is your plan to support not just small businesses in District 5, but also micro businesses who are often operated out of someone's home, kitchen, or some other part of their, of their uh, home or dwelling? What's your thoughts, Ms. Tamiko? Well, they want what well, they need. Um, I'm definitely open to um, having any conversation with the small business community, the micro business community. I have a lot of family members that own businesses, and I would definitely want to make sure that they survive. One of my family members owns a business across the street. So <laughs> I definitely want to make sure that the um, business community survives. I've met with the Franklin Business District, I've met with the Stockton Business District, and I um, continue to talk about programs to 
help children decide if they want to be entrepreneurs? How do we foster that? How do we create that in them? I definitely want to be a part of the solution and bring people to the table. How do we create workshops? What What is it that we need? What is it that you small business need? Do you need education on how to get that license? Or do you need a partnership with someone with who has a bigger business? Do you need a mentor? So I definitely want to be open and be a part of that conversation and help in that space. Excellent, all right. All right, uh, so let's see, who's next up, Adrian? Oh, I'm sorry. We're still going. We're still going around. Yeah, I'm trying to keep you guys on your toes. Thank you. All right, let's keep it going. Yes, I can. All right, so small business. What is your plan to support not just small businesses in District 5, but also micro businesses operated out of someone's home, kitchen, or some other non traditional location? I think we need to invest in small business and support them. They've had a rough time during the pandemic. I also support working from home and that reduces our transportation, that gives us better air quality and it's beneficial for a lot of reasons. I think we need tax incentives for small businesses. I like the program Sacramento did one year where they gave somebody $100,000 when people wrote grants for their ideas for a small business. I think we need to do more of that type of investment and invest in our community and keep it local as much as possible. Nice, thank you. And out of corporate hands. Thank you for that. Mr. Chris? Well, small business and big business is all the same to me in the community. I'll play a role. I had the opportunity of uh, working with one on the grocery store industry and I took it on myself. I didn't think I can do it because I'm just a community person and they talked to me and I helped them obtain that location up the street, Mac Road, Rio Linda, Rancho Cordova, and now we're looking at two other sites in the North area. As far as home businesses, I have a niece that uh, does great barbecue, but it's in Oregon. and. Um, she does it real well. She was doing it out of her car. And I said, you need to partner with someone at a restaurant that you go to all the time. And she partnered with someone, and now they let her sell her stuff in their store. So I'm for that. If you can partner with them, let's have some incentives with those home businesses and partner them up with a business out in the street, and they can work together and raise their income and be a prominent person in the community. All right, thank you. Yeah, so for me, um, this this year I actually became a small business owner myself, and I can you know firsthand say that there's a lot of challenges with starting a business in the city and probably anywhere in the state. California is a really expensive place to do so. Um, and then also my past experience, um, I worked for the, for three years prior to that for a Sacramento-based company where I helped them open ten new retail locations throughout the state of California. And I would say the biggest barrier uh, for, for many folks in small business and even micro business is the cost of opening up shop, right? Finding space that you can afford and navigating the permitting process. Um, I know because I've done this in cities, you know, now at 12 cities in California, Sacramento has a very onerous um, permitting process for buildings, a very onerous process for you to, to you know, get permitted to start open up shop. And of course, we're in, you know, not only a housing crisis, but our commercial space is really expensive as well. Um, so I think I'm really interested in looking at ways that we can streamline permitting, make it really easy, especially if you're, if you're a micro business, there's no reason why you should pay exorbitant fees or have difficulty navigating the process. And I think we can do that internally. Right, thank you. All right. Uh, I almost threw my name in the hat to run for District 5, but uh, after hearing you all, I'm glad I didn't because I think we have some wonderful talent up here, don't you guys think? You can clap now. <laughs> all right, thank you so much for those questions. And uh, who's up next? Hey, all right, Rosie. Hi, everyone. Rosie Ramos, a fellow OPD board member. Um, thank you all for your dedication to community. It's really important. So I have four questions, same process, same format. Um, starting with this one. District 5 faces environmental challenges related to air pollution, water quality, illegal dumping, abandoned vehicles, and more. What is your plan to advance environmental justice in District 5? And we're going to go ahead and start with this one. I've always considered myself an environmentalist, and I like to live in a clean city, a clean environment. Uh, we have a problem with illegal dumping in my neighborhood. People come and dump trucks, 
washers, dryers, you name it. Uh, resources to manage that need to be available, and we have that through 411. Uh, however, I don't know how to tackle that problem. I don't want surveillance videos in our neighborhood watching everything to catch people like that. Uh, however, we do have it with people's doorbells and such. But there should be fines for that type of thing. I'm not, I don't like pollution. I want a clean city. I want a clean environment. Like I said, working from home reduces emissions in our air. Anything that we can invest in to reduce pollution, improve air, improve water quality, those are essentials we need for life. Thank you. Well, I would say in some of the areas where there's a lot of dumping, some of the areas where I live, I would say surveillance cameras would be needed because it wouldn't be watching some of everybody else be positioned where all the mattresses and all that is being dumped. And in some areas where that was done, it was a great success. It cut down on a lot of the dumping, abandoning cars, and all that. And as far as pollution, I actually sit on a committee with the airport, 8617, and learning about different pollutions, how car shops do this, how they do that. And I was very excited to want to be part of that because I didn't know we had that much pollution in Sacramento that was being created by these different places. And now there's a strong arm to hold them accountable. And I'm loving it because our children go to school, our seniors take walks and all that stuff can get in their system. I think, so. um, I would say that we need to create an environment where it's easy for people to access the things that they need to get rid of things. So for example, we know that we can you know, go on the app and schedule a trash pickup but sometimes we need to meet people where they are. You know, OP made this a lot, or it's door knocking. We, making sure people know that they have this uh, opportunity to get rid of stuff that they may have uh, by scheduling a pickup day with the city. And so I think that that's incumbent on us to help educate people. And then on the, the front of environmental justice, I think we have to design communities in a way that encourage people to drive less, right? I live right next to the 99. Like, I'm constantly breathing in the fumes. We have some of the worst air quality in the district, or in the city, in this area. Um, and one way that we do that is designing communities where it's easy to walk and bike, where we have public transit that goes all over the city that allows you to get to your job, that allows you to get to childcare. Um, you don't have to sit in your car in traffic. I just got rid of my car a few days ago and I'm trying not to go carless and I think that it's incumbent on all of us to be a part of that, but we have to make it easy for people to do it. And it's, it's very difficult right now, but if we have leadership that's thinking towards that, then, then that's the way we need to go. One of the ways I think is definitely empower your neighborhood associations. Um, if you empower your neighborhood associations, they can be the educator that you need for the 311 system. Um, when I moved to North City Farms, we started a neighborhood association. We empowered the people to understand what the 311 system could do. We did neighborhood cleanups. We helped um, neighbors who didn't even know that was a thing. We taught them how to use the system and take the picture and they'll come pick it up. The other thing that um, I've been working on is that uh, your active transportation commissioner is looking at how to do some of these street calmings. Franklin Boulevard is on, on the deck next. We're calming that street. We're taking it from four lanes to two. One of the things that is that one of the things about that street is there's only one city tree. So we need to make sure that we're planting trees. We need to make sure that we have lights and sidewalks and walkability so that people have the option to take uh, to walk or to have the option to take the bus because they have a overcast or because there's shade available to them. Thank you. Okay, next question. I will start with Mr. Chris. Um, what will you do as city council member to provide housing to the unhoused? Well, I will work with all partners and uh, find some solutions to it. As I work with one and a good friend of mine that's a pastor out there, uh, we were in the process of putting 160 units on these five acres, but that fell apart. I would still work with those partners, but we'd have to come with some solutions with other partners within the city, our colleagues, to work hard together and put differences aside and come out of our personal silos and work together to fix this problem. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so for the last you know, two plus years, you know, we've been doing work on the ground through SACSU. 
and talking with folks. And we know that um, in places like Sacramento where housing affordability is, is skyrocketing is also where you see homelessness skyrocket. So we have to address our affordability crisis if we're gonna do it and make an impact on homelessness. But I do wanna say that the city does go above and beyond. The city has uh, put more resources toward, resources toward homelessness and they're required to do by law. We need to work together as a region. Um, the county needs to step up. It's time for us to actually have a partnership and it has not been happening. And I think that the way that we do that is by electing leaders that are willing to work together. That's why I'm excited that there's three new seats up on the city council and one of the board of supervisors to create that partnership. And I wanna model something after what's happening in Marysville. They have what's called the Sutter Yuba Homeless Consortium, where two counties, five cities, the school districts, hospitals, everyone works together. And the most important part is they pool their funding together to use an economy of scale to address the problem that they have. That's not what we're doing here and that's what we need to do. I wanna see everyone working together and pooling resources. Yeah, the city can't do it alone. We have to partner. Um, we have to work with the county. We have to work with the nonprofits. We have to work with the business owners. We have to work together in order to curb this problem that we have, the homeless. Um, we need to work in creating incubators, going to meet them where they are, talking to them, creating their trust in order to, say, to help bring them off the street. Um, the key is partnership, partnership with everyone, bringing everyone to the table. We have too many situations where we're working in silos. There's too many different organizations working, trying to do this on their own. And what happens when people try to do it on their own, they get overwhelmed, they get overworked, and they just give up. So we have to continue to work together, try to solve some of these issues and these gaps, put people in the gaps, and I hope to be that person that can fill in those gaps to bring these communities together and help that we can ushering a new change. Thank you. Okay, question three. Um, and we'll go ahead and start with Ms. Kate. Uh, construction at the UC Davis Med Center has created a parking issue. She hasn't gone. Oh, yes, right around. I was gonna go all the way around, but that's totally Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> My name is Melody, I'm so sorry. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. It's all my bad. Okay, so what will you do as city council member to provide housing to the unhoused? Okay, I'm gonna repeat what they said. We need to partnership with the county uh, and provide wraparound service for some of the population. Sacramento has a land trust, and there are many possibilities and options to use that land to create social living spaces and social community spaces. I'd also like to see partnerships with folks like Habitat for Humanity, who have proven, they've proven that they can do the work and provide housing that will remain affordable in the future as well as now. So we do need to build some new housing and I think like I said partner with the county and provide wraparound service get these people off the streets and into housing as soon as we can thank you my apologies again <laughs> okay third question um, and we'll start with this Katie uh, construction at the UC Davis Men Center has created parking issues in the surrounding neighborhoods what will you do as a council member to reduce parking and traffic impacts of big development projects in D5? That's a really good question. It's something I haven't thought about before, so I appreciate it. Um, but the first thing that comes to mind is whenever we have big projects like this, just like with the development of the Eddie Square project and the community benefits agreement that came out of that by talking and communicating with the, with the community and coming to an agreement on what they needed to um, mitigate those negative impacts, I think this is something that the community needs to go and the council member, whoever gets elected, to have that conversation with UC Davis and see what they're willing to, to do and provide. Um, you know, they do have a lot of money and I do think that if there are negative impacts from the parking situation as a result of what they are building, then we should have that conversation with them and see if they can help us either build a structure to help with parking or as we've seen in some other cities and, and situations, maybe they can lease out a space uh, you know, down the road and then bring in shuttles, whatever that may be, but it's really important that it doesn't negatively impact the community Right, they've been there, they live there, and it's not, it shouldn't be something where you can't now you know, park in your own neighborhood or bring your kids to school, and so I think it's all a partnership with, with UC Davis to do that. Something I never thought about either, but I definitely agree, we should definitely work on community contract, work with them, talk to them, talk to the city, and see what we can do to eliminate some of that problem. 
um, just so just work on a community contract, have a conversation with both the community and and the square. And we'll go back to Ms. Kessler over here. <laughs> it is something I've thought about actually, and I worked for UC Davis for two and a half years as a temporary chair, and worked all over Sacramento and the campus at Davis also. Uh, Finding a parking before work was always a challenge. You were lucky if you worked the 6.30 shift, you could grab a free street parking. But I believe UC Davis has an amazing amount of revenue and they are a for-profit hospital. I think they could do better with SAC and they could do better for SAC and provide better, I don't know, just they could do better for SAC. I, I'm concerned that we're selling out our city to UC Davis and they're gonna own this city in a minute. They are not providing healthcare for Medi-Cal patients unless you go to the emergency room or under some kind of research. So what do they do for our lower income people? They do have great programs, but I am concerned about their Actually, we, I don't think we all thought about it, but I looked at it and I would work with UC Davis Shuttle Services Regional Transit and the agency that has shuttle from power and light rail all the way to the county buildings, the courthouse, and come up with some type of plan where if you're working at UC Davis, where are you parking? Strategic thought is like a location if they can grade it, do something, and cut down on the traffic and just have a central location on shuttle buses to pick you up and take you to your place of destination. Thank you. I got everyone right. <laughs> okay, last question for me. Uh, we'll go ahead and start with Ms. Tomiko. Uh, speaking on Broadway between MLK and 42nd Street has led to multiple deadly accidents in the past six months. What would you do to reduce traffic speeds and enhance safety along Broadway and its arterial streets? Oh, man. As your active transportation commissioner, <laughs> I have definitely, definitely been looking at that. Um, and I know there's been about 12, maybe more, that haven't been reported accidents uh, uh, over there. Um, continue to calm the streets. Um, we are looking at different ways to um, address Broadway, whether that is um, adding a bus lane itself. Um, we're looking at I know there's a lot of uh, crossings right now, but we're just looking at different ways to address Broadway issues at MLK and how kids get to school. Um, there's a lot of transportation um, um, plans for that section between uh, Stockton to MLK and then also from MLK to down onto, what are they calling it now, Upper Land. Um, so definitely looking at different ways to calm that and work with um, I used to live on 42nd, so I'm aware of that traffic area. Uh, the, my neighbors have told me they like to see some speed bumps put in on 42nd Street. Uh, that street light right there, apparently a lot of people are trying to beat it, so it's become a pretty fast street to go through right there and it's causing some problems. Uh, we could find some kind of solution to reduce the traffic over there and slow it down and uh, create a safer type of driving area. I would work with uh, the traffic safety division within the city and all other partners and look at the time of day that heavy traffic is there, such as if, if it's kids go, going to school, if it's speaking coming out of different areas and set up some type of program where we can say, well, this is the time it's happening and put time, some type of safety barriers, as you see down the street what they did, create something like that, and if that doesn't work, it's time to write people tickets. And that'll make people aware once they get those tickets. Yeah, I think back to just by design, right? We have to make sure that we're designing roads that are discouraging people from speeding. Um, I was talking with someone who's been in the neighborhood a long time recently, and they brought something to my attention I hadn't thought about, which was 
Um, when those streets were originally made, when Broadway was originally made, um, there wasn't the amount of people living here. There wasn't the, you know, there wasn't as many cars traveling down it. And now we just have so many more people coming to the neighborhood and driving on our streets. And so they're speeding down the street that was, you know, created wide. And that's encouraging people to go faster. And so I really look towards things like the Envision Broadway Project, which is going to kind of lessen those, those lanes and cre create bike lanes, create walkability. Um, and that's going to discourage, hopefully, people from driving faster. And I also think of particularly that one bend where the car unfortunately has thrown into the building many times now. Um, and I saw that there were bollards up. That's good. Um, making sure that we're doing more to alert people of that turn. People are speeding down Broadway, and then they're just completely caught off guard by that turn, or they're not paying attention, or they're on their phone. So, I think it's a mix of all of those things, but particularly, you know, designing our streets in a way that encourages people to drive slower. Thank you very much. That wraps up my batch of questions. I will hand it over for our next one. Okay. Thank you, Willie. How you guys doing? Everybody good? First of all, I want to thank you guys for coming out. Um, you know, this part of the political process, a lot of times, unfortunately, in our country now, being skipped, right? So to be able to have our candidates up here in this form, I want to thank all PNA, right? Uh, because it's just really transformative, so you get to actually see and hear the answers. So, um, all right, so my first question, I'm going to start here with Ms. Ms. Kimberly, is uh, achievements. What do you believe is the single most important problem facing Oak Park that you can solve during your four-year term? How do you propose to resolve it? Poverty, food insecurity, uh, programs for our youth. Culture investment. I'd like to see some dance studios put in and some culture activities. Seems like we've got a crowd. Uh, I love Oak Park. Uh, I moved here from Oakland and I felt very comfortable and familiar here. It reminded me a lot of Oakland. And uh, yeah, I see a lot of kids out that needs some resources. Poverty is a problem in some areas. Okay, uh, same question. Uh, Mr. Baker, do you repeat that? Okay, achievements. What do you believe is the single most important problem facing Oak Park that you can solve during your four-year term? How do you propose to resolve it? But I think the single most problem that we can look at is the homelessness, the uh, youth programs is not here, and one thing I look at is uh, when I come through here is why does Martin Luther King have to look so sloppy? I would like to see trees on Martin Luther King. I would like to have youth be trained in a program so they can go out and be part of the community. I would like to see them working at the stores in this community, bring more stores here so it won't be considered a food desert. Then work on incentives with folks that own homes here that we can help them redo their homes, their grass, the fences, pull things away from there so this can be beautified. There's no reason Oak Park cannot look as beautiful as Land Park or somewhere. That's what I would work hard on. Okay. Uh, I, I, I think I got it. Okay. <laughs> well, I think that there's a lot of big problems and there were uh, many things that I thought of when you asked the question, but um, I always tell people my number one overarching goal of all the entire policy platform is all around poverty reduction because I think, you know, if we can focus on creating economic mobility in this district, we can see all of the rest of the issues that we talked about begin to get better, including, you know, public safety, making sure that people have the ability to buy homes, all of these things. And so one thing I can think of in particular is creating pathways to really good jobs for people. Right? As I mentioned earlier, this is an 80% low-income district. There are a lot of neighborhoods in the district where people are making, on average, less than $20,000 a year. And they're stretched thin with housing, with childcare, and everything. And so I'm proudly endorsed by many of the trade unions, including sheet mill workers and carpenters. And I would love to work on programs where we can build pathways to apprenticeships through our schools in the district and through uh, places like the Fruit Ridge Collaborative where you work out with Mr. Benjamin. And, um, I think that creating those good jobs and pathways and creating economic mobility is going to help us in everything that we want to do. Uh, Mr. Rico. 
um, like you said, there's probably a number of things that we could talk about. Or one of the things that I want to, one of the goals that I want to do is bring back a library to Oak Park. And so within my two years, I, I want to bring back this library, bring back a library to Oak Park. And in doing that, I believe that would open up the set, open up kids to be able to have a center to go after school, to be able to become um, board stewards. Uh, my daughter is graduating from um, Simmons, master's degree in children's literature. So I think that reading and developing is very, very important to me. And so that center could also be a development place for adults who need that extra um, resume building workshop or financial literacy workshop. But I believe that that to me is one of the things I want to see in the park and one of the things that I want to achieve. Okay, question two. So we recently, we just, right? Um, I'm gonna start with Mr. Baker. Uh, the district has resulted in District 5 picking up part of va the Valley High neighborhood in South Sacramento. What do you see as some of the challenges faced by that portion of the district? Well, some of the challenges I see, whoever, actually I think I'm the only one up here that lives in that area, know it very well, whoever comes in, there's a challenge working in this area and then working in that area. I think if you bring people together to learn about each other, we can create a, even a better District 5 and not have folks look at it as, oh, we're part of Oak Park now, I'm hearing that in the community. We're part of Oak Park now, we need to fix that and I will work hard to change that with community programs, partner together, park events on during the summer, here, South area, work together on those issues. Yeah, I would say, uh, for me, I think that one of the biggest challenges of folks who live uh, far south of the district is being able to access um, the resources that are available in the urban core, whether that's jobs, whether that's community programs, uh, and I think that leads back to public transit, right? So we have a lot of people who live in that area who are making, again, less than $20,000 a year. They're spending no time sitting in their car two, two hours a day, um, you know, pay, paying more for childcare because they're sitting in traffic. And I think about ways that we can connect all parts of the city using public transit um, and, and allow people more equity in, in the ability to access resources. I also think that we need to bring more, more city dollars into the neighborhoods. We need to be um, investing in programs and nonprofits and the organizations that are already doing work on the ground in these areas, and they haven't been invested in for a very long time. Um, so I'm interested in finding ways that we can, you know, connect with these organizations that are doing, uh, you know, work on the ground, making sure that we're resourcing them, and then making sure that people can't get to the urban core for jobs and other things that they need. Okay. So being that I'm from Sacramento, I've lived all over Sacramento. So I grew up not only in the east, I grew up in the, the south. So I'm very familiar. I, my grandparents own the home golf course for us. So that's a part of the district. So I grew up, my, I think my second apartment was off the Mac Broken Center Park. So, so that part coming into the district is, is very familiar to me. Um, my friend runs Southside Christian, Christian Center, which is in the Valley, in Valley High area, which brings in the district. So working together and bringing that connectivity throughout the district is very important. We're looking at street connections. I know we talk about transit, we talk about street connecting, um, we talk about all this, but reality is today, um, some of those lines haven't been fixed, changed since the 50s. And so we just have to work on creating the, we, we have to work on knocking down those boundaries and working together. So doing things like movie nights, like Mr. Baker said, doing those things like reaching out to the neighborhood associations um, and talking with them and partnering with them and bringing them together is something that just, just has to happen in order to be a cohesive district five. Ms. Kimberly. I would love to build alliance and bridge, bridge the communities together and pour resources into the deep property sections of those neighborhoods, have safe and reliable transportation systems that can help people get around to their jobs, education, and healthcare systems. Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, this is my third question. And it's the second question I have for redistricting, right? As a result of redistricting, District 5 is now 80% non-white and one of the lower income districts in the city. How will you ensure that diverse voices from across the district are represented? 
We'll start with uh, uh, Ms. Maple, please. So this is something that um, I committed to in every single one of my endorsement interviews, every um, conversation I've had around the campaign is, I'm only one person and one voice um, and one perspective, and the only way that we make policy that works for everyone is by having everyone at the table. Um, so I, at day one, I want to create what's called a community cabinet or a community council, which is going to have representatives from every neighborhood in the district. Um, it's going to have representatives from different ethnic groups, from people from different religions and churches, from um, every group that is needs to have a voice in the district, folks from the LGBTQ community. Because I acknowledge that I, you know, I don't know everything, and it's really important for me to have people in the room who can advise me on policy. And that's every policy, right? That's making sure that you know I might have something come across my desk that I think is only going to impact this, and then I, and, and I bring it to the council, and they're like, actually, this is going to do something that's going to really impact my neighbor. Um, that's really important for me to know. And so uh, that's my commitment moving forward. Uh, if elected, I will always have the community at the table, and uh, I'll be calling a lot of you to make sure that I have your opinions. So I, I will have the community at the table, but I'll also be appointing them to boards and commissions, because reality is that a lot of the work gets done in these boards and commissions. Um, we have to have people that understand planning, that understand transportation, that understand Measure U. We have to have people in these commissions that um, work on these policies that advise the council on how we should move throughout the district. So my commitment is also is always working with the community and appointing people that have the best interests of the community. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Kimberly? I like to embrace culture diversity and uh, cultural inclusion. And I'd love to see inclusion and different perspectives brought to the table. We need to embrace our differences and different perspectives and communicate them so we can come to a better understanding of each other and live together better. And last, Mr. Baker. I think it's safe to say we all got the same ideas up here. Um, I would also like to bring all the cultures together in different communities, find out what the need is, what their concern is, and also get them on commissions and boards because a lot of them don't understand little things that's going on in the city, but if they were on boards, they can go out and communicate to the culture that they're within that don't speak that great English and start pointing them to these boards and getting them out in the community and then work with them again to see what's going on out there and we can be much better across all the council districts. Thank you. Okay, and this last question, uh, I'm going to start on the end with this Tomiko, uh, COVID-19, right? Uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic receding, but not yet gone, what can you do as a council member to support continued resilience against the virus? Support continued resilience against the virus. One time? No. Okay. Um, just continue to educate people. Um, tell them the benefits of um, getting vaccinated. Um, I am, been, you know, I got, I was, I was first in line, that's what I like to say. You know, I went to Kaiser and was like, hey, you got any extra? <laughs> so I, I just wanted to make sure that I continue talking to people and making sure that they, they know the benefits of the vaccine, or not just know the benefits of the vaccine, know the benefits of how to change your business culture, do, th do things differently. You don't always have to be in a store. You can do things like, if, if one of the good things that my, my cousin's store does is they do crystals, right? And I got all these bracelets on. They do it online. Because you know that's just a way, a different way to do business, right? You have a community that goes online to talk about crystals and purchasing different things in the store. So just think about different things and take it, take it different. And I'm Ms. Kimberly. I have a background in healthcare. I was studying to be a nurse and I worked as a nurse assistant. I went through a divorce and I had to, I was a single mom with two kids and had to put my studies aside. Uh, I worked at the COVID clinic this summer with Dignity Health. On a busy day, we vaccinated over 2,000 people a day. In my neighborhood, there's a few people who don't believe in the vaccination, don't trust it, don't trust the government. It's challenging to say the least. There are ways to do it, but we need to continue our resilience against this virus. It's making a comeback right here. 
And uh, with that being said, we need, if, if it does make a comeback, we need to prevent our renters and landlords from any evictions too that came up with this pandemic. So it's all intertwined. I, I would agree with what Mr. Meikle said, is uh, stay focused on it and educate the businesses, the communities, and also have respect for those that really don't believe in the vaccine. Bring together those and find out why they don't believe in it and work with them so you won't have this chaos, everybody clashing. But the most important thing is to stay focused on it, help businesses understand what it's about, give them more pamphlets so they can hand them to their customers and understand it. But as she, Ms. Kimberly said, it, it's coming back and we need to be ready and focused to spearhead that thing. So I support it 100%. Yeah, so we now know that this is endemic. So that our lives are now forever changed and we'll be living with COVID-19 for the rest of our lives and probably future generations as well. Um, and so we have to come to terms with that. We've gotten a lot of learning from that. Um, I, I really want to focus on how do we help uh, businesses and um, organizations that were most impacted by COVID-19 and the pandemic recover, and then also make sure that they, not only the businesses, but also school districts and, and other organizations have the support that they need. One thing that we saw is that people were running out of PPE. Uh, this happened in our schools. Uh, our teachers just recently went on strike and wanted to contract, and part of that issue was all centered around how uh, the resources they did or did not have during the pandemic. So I think we need to always have a strategic action plan in place for emergencies, including uh, future pandemics that may happen, or you know, and that includes making sure that there's resource with PPE and other um, other materials that they need. And so I think that that's you know incumbent on the city, but also the county. Again, the county's responsible for public health. Um, this is another area where we really need to work in partnership with the county, and I'm um, looking forward to that happening. Thank you. So those that's the end of my questions. Yeah, I'm gonna uh, pass it to. Uh, OPNA President Adrian Rain, can I just real quick? Oh yeah. Uh, so OPNA is about action. Um, we started a, an initiative called Park Cares because we, we realized that the community needed help immediately, right? And so we offer bill assistance through this program. I need for everybody in here to at least donate a dollar today, right? Um, this is what it's about, it's about this action, okay? So we, we do have that in the community and we'd like you all to help contribute. Thank you. program, by the way, we've raised and paid out over $10,000 to Oak Park residents, largely in the form of $200 checks. And in many cases, as, as some of the board members know, we are driving those $200 checks to someone's home when they really, really, really need it. So it's a wonderful program. Again, as Mike said, the QR code is the key to donate to support this program. And again, more handouts up front, more handouts up front. Uh, so, so we're actually ahead of schedule, which it kind of surprised me. Um, so I have a few questions. And I think what we will do like a raise of hand if we want to continue or if you guys want to break 10 minutes early and hang out with the candidates, but we'll get there when we get there. Yeah, in the meantime, I have a couple of questions. Um, the first one's a fun one. Uh, how can you help build a better relationship between labor and the Sacramento City Unified School District? Oh. <laughs> labor and the Sacramento City Unified School District. I love education. I'm always learning. I want to learn more. I want our kids to learn. I want them to thrive in education. I think we all should embrace that. I think our teachers are the most underpaid, most important job we have and they have in the world. We trust them with our most precious, valuable, valuable things, our children. We really need to work together to support our teachers and our students. We are preparing them for the future. They are gonna be our stewards, our leaders. We really, really, really need to invest in education and our teachers, our union labor folks that should be behind that. I would think they would have children in an education system and could understand that. I would say the same thing to work with both labor unions, all of them involved in the school district, the superintendent, and I would also say bring parents in to understand what's going on, how the budget is done, and why is it such in such a way it is, and 
One thing we did when I sat on the transition committee in Washington, D.C. is there was a particular school in that area that was zoned the worst, the worst school, low area. And what they did is they went in with parents and the parents got a chance to look at the school's budget to see here's what we got to pay, here's what we got to pay. And the labor union was here's what we do, here's what we do. And what they found is everybody came to an agreement and wow, we didn't know that. So I think if we try something like that, come to some type of unity, will it work? We won't know until we try it because everybody has a strong opinion about their issues. Yeah, I think just to be frank, um, it's really apparent that there's a, a rough relationship between the school district and between um, some of the unions that represent the workers in the school district, and that has been the case for many, many years. Um, you know, I collected as a city council member, I won't have you know direct say over what happens between the school district and the teachers, but I do stand in solidarity with them, and I was on the strike line for uh, the classified workers and for the teachers this most recent go around, and I was really, really glad to see that they reached a contract that they can agree upon. But I think moving forward, we need. Um, to have real healing between the district and between teachers and other staff in the district, we need to have transparency. We need to have people who are willing to come to the table and have open, honest conversations about what's working and what's not. Um, and I think, you know, unfortunately, there were a lot of tactics that were, you know, things weren't about uh, coming and meeting people in person and having this tough conversation. So I would just, to me, that's leadership. Leadership is showing up. and. You know, having tough conversations even if you don't agree with people, and I'd just love to see more of that between the district and the unions. Yeah, I would agree. I definitely would want to be a part of the conversation and help facilitate some of the conversation, but as council, we don't have a role in that. Um, but I would definitely like to see parents come um, and talk with the labor unions and the teachers so they can talk together. I'm a Sacramento Sac City school kid, so um, seeing that strike and knowing the kids had already been through a two-year learning gap was, is, was very challenging to watch. So I definitely want to see them continue to come together to make a better school district, but um, if it's just me showing up and being that facilitator for these groups, um, I'm willing to do that. Thank you. So Chris, you're, you're first for this one. Um, it's about home, home ownership. It's projected that black home ownership nationwide will hit its lowest point since the 60s in the next 10 years. Do you feel the city of Sacramento has an obligation to create pathways to maintaining and increasing black home ownership? Yes, I do. If we look at certain areas where it's very low, I think we should be offering some type of incentives and then first find out why they can't qualify to buy a home, whether it's the loan, whether it's their credit, create some type of program to build their credit up to get them qualified to buy that home. And I think that is actually something we should be doing. And that I'm a council member, I work towards that goal. Because they do that all the time in certain areas. I was just at one Wells Fargo, and I was amazed at how they were teaching the young kids right now how to keep their credit straight so they can buy a home in these areas. And I think we should do that with the folks here in this area. Yeah. So. Um Pathways to home ownership is a, is a huge component of my campaign, and you know I think it's one of the best ways to build generational wealth, and also to see folks who've been in the community forever stay in the communities that they live in. Um, I, you know, I one thing specific thing that I thought about is uh, the cannabis industry here in Sacramento produces, uh, you know, 16, 18 million dollars a year in just a cannabis-specific tax. It's not sales and use taxes or anything else, um, and currently all of that money goes into the general fund. Um, I'm really interested in looking at pathways that we can utilize some of those funds and, ch and target them specifically um, to communities that have been harmed by the war on drugs or, or areas where we can help people build generational wealth, including areas like a park. Um, and so, you know, I, we have to get creative. It's really hard to find new funds. Um, cannabis is one of those very few uh, sources that are left and um, just want to get, you know, very creative as we look at the budget and find ways to, to do that because it's going to cost money. And we all know that. So <laughs> that's the hardest part of making policy. I think education is the biggest thing. I went to something that was at the Sojourn of Truth on 24th and Florin, and they had a realtors event that was talking about home ownership and um, talking to the group that were there. So I think if you didn't grow up in a home or if you grew up around people who own homes, you don't know that that's a pathway for you. And you don't even know where to begin. So, and it, so it's education, telling them or showing them 
these are things that you need to purchase a home. It could be something that they could have a good credit score and they don't even know it because they didn't look and they don't know where to look. So you have to just educate people. You have to trust, they have to be able to trust your realtors. Sometimes you don't even know where to begin. You don't even know that you can interview a realtor. You don't have to go with a person that you think that you see on the billboard. There's tons of them out there. Education is key to this. And um, it does open up way to pay, uh, generational wealth. You can pay off your loan, you pay off credit debt. If you own a home, then you have equity in it. You can buy a car, you can help that kid you have get, you know, pay through college. So there's just a, a bunch of different ways to um, go about owning a home. <laughs> I totally agree. <laughs> So yeah, I believe education is key. And then from there, we need livable wages. We need to invest in minority home ownership programs, lift people up in poverty, balance the playing field, because homes are very expensive right now. Um, yeah. I would say invest in minority home ownership programs. Thank you. All right, so this was for Katie first. Um, also on home ownership, sort of. What, what is your stance on enacting an ordinance that would give tenants the first right of refusal to buy properties they are renting? So this is actually something that I talked about on the campaign trail and that I support. Uh, I think especially in areas where we see the gentrification is an issue like the park um, and, and areas in, as it goes down south. Um, we need to create opportunities for people. If you live in your home, I've met personally just walking through the neighborhood, knocking on doors, people who've lived and rented their in their homes for you know 10, 20, 30 years. Um, there's no reason why they shouldn't have an opportunity to buy if they can. But that also means that you need to follow that up with having a pool of funding so that people can gain access to buy it. If you've been renting for years, maybe you don't have money saved up for a down payment. That's usually the biggest barrier for people. It was the biggest barrier for me. Um, and so, you know, once again, looking at you know, creative strategies, maybe using that cannabis fund or other sources to help people be able to purchase it and also giving them the first right of refusal. I support that. You know, that's the first time I heard something like that, so I don't know how I feel about it. I would, I would definitely need to look more into it and see what the language is about it. But I definitely believe in having the opportunity and working with the individual to see if they want to purchase a home, um, but also being um, realistic about where they are. Because like you said, if you've been rated for a long time, you might not be ready to purchase that home. You might not have the capital to purchase that home. And like I said earlier, you might not even know how to begin to purchase the home. So um, education would be key in um, helping individuals uh, be able to do that. So having the first right of refusal um, could be disingenuous because they, they, they may not even know how to do that. Um, so it's one of those things that I, I can't say yes or no on that. I love the idea. I'm a renter. I feel like I paid off my landlord's house already. Um, I am paying probably mortgage rate rents. So uh, if I had an opportunity to buy, be the person to buy the house I'm living in that I've invested, I've done the yard work, I've kept the maintenance up, I know this house, that would be a beautiful thing to me. I dream of opening a house still, even though it's slipping further and further away, this would be one avenue with the investment of like Katie said, a down payment, because that is a deterrent, a major deterrent. If we could get some sort of housing funds like that to help with down payments, that would be a step up. Because in the housing crisis, those lending, we can't have predatory lending procedures. I'm going to agree with Nico. I'm not sure how to answer that correctly, but I'll look more into it. The, the incentives we have that can create that home ownership, I live in an apartment, so I don't know what it's like, but it can be done if we create those incentives and find out if they were refused, why were they refused? There may be a reason. Maybe it's their credit. Maybe they're just not ready. 
I would like to look more into that. And if they do need that credit build up, let's create an incentive program that they can buy it at home. And it's a good idea and I want to actually learn more about it. Thank you. So uh, this question, technically my last, but we'll see. Um, Tamiko first, it's on zoning. What are your thoughts on upzoning or the conversion of single family designated lots to have up to four units? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, with the current way that the housing crisis is, we need to be um, open to building. We need to create as much property as possible. So um, I definitely think that that's a conversation that needs to happen with the community, a conversation that needs to happen with builders and all in together. Um, I don't. Off, on the offset, I don't, I don't know. I don't see a problem with it, but at the same time, it has to be a community conversation, and um, we need to work with them to ensure that um, this is the right thing for them. I think my first place that I purchased was a four-unit complex, um, so I owned the number one unit. So I, I've seen it happen. Um, depends on. It just depends. It, I, I, don't, I don't see an issue with it. I think we need to be open to all types of buildings to calm this housing crisis that we're in. I believe it's a controversial issue. Uh, it's mixed in my neighborhood from knock on doors, people tell me they don't like it. Uh, what I understand is happening with that one is we're getting more luxury condos and like luxury Airbnb spaces. Uh, people are putting four buildings in a backyard lot. Uh, I think in certain neighborhoods it could be done, but I don't think it's a cookie cutter type of policy that can be done anywhere. So it needs to be looked at in different ways. But yeah, I'm not a big fan of it right now, but I don't, I'm not, the expert on it. So this is one of those where I have to be like, it's not about me, it's about my community and what they want. Actually, I, I think it's a good idea. If it can be done, it can be done. But what we need to do is bring all the communities in and sit everybody down and say, here's the plan, what we want to do. And we want to do this, do this, do this. And if that community doesn't want it and they keep pushing back, and fighting, then we have to come up with some other solution because if we're continue fighting amongst each other, we'll have a whole year and you haven't achieved nothing. So we need to find other sources, other incentives, maybe to go somewhere else in these vacant lots and build those units. Yeah, so there's some controversy over this issue and it's something that I've learned a lot about over the last you know, couple of years or so. Um, you know, creating single family zoning in the city of Sacramento was a policy decision. And it was something that we didn't have before and that we created. And I think undoing it can also be a policy decision. Um, I know that that can be um, fearful for some people who live in single family neighborhoods and they're worried about you know, parking issues or people coming in. One of the biggest uh, issues that I've heard from people as we talk about up zoning is um, renters moving into the neighborhood. I actually don't think that there's a problem with that. I support up zoning, and that's a controversial take for me to take, but I think it's important we're in a housing crisis. We need to come up with, we need to take every tool in our tool belt to fix this problem, this crisis, and that's one of them. And I always use the example of where I, I used to live. Uh, years ago, I lived in Boulevard Park. I lived in a, a Victorian that had been turned into a duplex across the street from a sixplex, next to single family homes and, and a fourplex on the corner. And everybody got along fine. We had a mix of incomes in the neighborhood. There was no parking issues. We had a park, and so, that's what I see as upsetting. That's the potential, and I don't see single-family neighborhoods getting bulldozed and every everything being a four a fourplex, especially places where you know the single-family homes are very high priced. And so I don't I don't subscribe to some of the fear tactics around it. And I support it. Thank you. Okay, folks. So we have some more questions. What time is it? What time is it? Like seven ten? Okay. All right. We're actually relatively on time. So I actually was thinking maybe for one more question to give you guys like a, a rate, you know, you can raise your hands depending on what type of question you want to hear. Does that sound cool? Um, so like for example, we can ask a question on private property, we can ask a question on McClatchy Park, or we can ask a question about charter schools. 
So is there any one, so like what I could do is say private property, you guys raise your hand, you wanna hear about that? Okay, I see seven-ish, maybe eight. McClatchy Park, quite a few, and charter schools. Not enough of you, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm loud though, but I appreciate it. Um, yeah. So, so McClatchy Park, um, and we'll start, are, are we okay, are you okay to start for this one? Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, what, if anything, would you do, would you propose doing because of the vandalism and theft of the fencing around the playground at McClatchy Park? Vandalism at McClatchy Park. What fencing are we talking about? The playground fencing. <coughs> And what will we do to prevent it? Yeah. Have community members be vigilant? Uh, uh, I don't know, deter in any kind of way we could, I guess. Um, I wasn't aware that this fence was being vandalized. I'm sorry. Um, I don't get to play around much, yeah, so. <laughs> I walk through there with my dog all the time, but I haven't noticed that far. Um, yeah, I don't know the answer to that question, but I would be happy to research it and come up with some good ideas. Were any of the community questions, like, I mean, they've all been community questions, but this is the, these are the, the closers, so. <laughs> okay. No, I wasn't aware of that. The extra question. I'm not into uh, demolishing a property at all, so I need to find a way to stop it, deter that. I'm not aware of that, but uh, it was an issue in the South area, and I would say, get with all the community members, whether we need to put, what is it, LED lighting out there, better lighting, surveillance cameras, and before we do that, bring in the community partners and hey, we're going to have surveillance cameras here. It's not to get the guy's license plate, it's not to watch you, it's to watch this prank playground and what's going on here. And I think that would be a good idea. I mean, the eyes on the poles, as you see when you're going down these streets, they have cameras on some of the poles. I think that would be a deterrent, especially with the better lighting. Yeah, I agree on the lighting front. I think having more lighting, you know, they've done psychological studies on this. If you are, if you uh, believe that you are to be seen, you are less likely to do something. Also, why they have mirrors up in, in retail establishments. If you see yourself doing something, um, you're less likely to do it. So just by design, making sure that we design it in a way that it makes it hard for people to do that. But I also think like investing in youth programs, making sure that, you know, kids have things to do after school. And, you know, I know I, like, I certainly got into trouble when I was a, a kid and a teenager. And, if I had more places to channel my energy um, in, in youth programming, I probably might not have done some of those things. And so, um, that obviously, assuming that this might be, you know, the youth doing it, um, we need to invest in this program to make sure that we have, you know, lighting and other ways to prevent. Yeah, I was gonna, lighting is one of the biggest things I was going to say, but also maybe murals. Um, put something up there um, that will maybe deter someone from painting on it. It, but people are going to do things in the middle of the night, so everybody's not going to be able to watch it. So just have continued co community conversations around it so that we're watching it, cleaning it, making sure it's taken down immediately, and um, that way people get tired of keep continuously putting it up. Thank you. Okay, looking at the audience again. Do we want to hear one minute closing statements from them and then hang out with the candidates? Yes. All right. So. Who would like to go first? Give me a one minute closing statement. Let's we'll see if there's a volunteer. <laughs> All right, you got the mic. <laughs> I'll go. Um, again, I just want to thank you guys for sitting through this time with us and um, listening to how we want to help the city and uh, better the city. Uh, how you can help me, because <laughs> that's how I'm going to close. How you can help me is continue to put my name out there, vote. Make sure you are walking and talking to Nico for the city, or Nico depends on how well you know each other. Um, 
but I just want to make sure that um, we continue to talk about me, talk about what I love, talk about um, the organizations that I volunteer for, talk about my experience with the state, talk about uh, my commitment to the city, and um, just get out there and vote. My sister and my best friend is here. They have a sign-up paper if you want to get, get with me. They have my QR code. They have information if you want to have a conversation with me. They have a sign-in sheet if you want to do that too. So. <laughs> yeah, I would say thank you so much for making the time to come out here. I know it's not easy when you're at work and you have kids and you have you know responsibilities to make it out in a 6 p.m. forum. And so thank you so much. And your ideas and the questions that you ask help inform me and all of us. I learned so much from all of you as well being up here. Um, and I, I will, I'll close the same way that I close every you know speech that I give is I, accessibility is key to my campaign. As I go and knock on doors and talk to people, one of the things that I hear the most is that they don't, they haven't felt uh, a sense of accessibility to their city council member. And uh, I'm, I'm completely different. I give my cell phone number to everyone. I have cards out on the table out there as well. Some literature you can pick up. Please call me, text me, give me your ideas. Um, this is not about me. This is about all of you and how we can put our brains together and put our ideas into action. And so I'm really looking forward to doing that. And if you want to come knock, knock on doors with me, we're out every single weekend. Uh, you can sign up on katiemaple.com uh, or you can catch me or my campaign manager, Caitlin, afterwards. Thank you. I will say the same as my name is. I left some cards out there. If you have ideas, you want to talk to me to see what I'm about, regardless of who sitting up here, I think it's key. Whoever wins, all four of us, I think we are the key still to stay in this and keep things intact. And, and my goal is to stay involved, whether I'm successful or not, like I've been doing the last 23 years in my community. And I'm going to continue to do it and work with that person that wins that seat. And that's my closing statement to continue doing what I'm doing. Thank you for coming. I love this diverse audience. I love the diverse questions. They were very good questions. I will take them home and meditate on them. I know I will say, oh, I should have said that. I should have said that. It always happens that way. So in these type of platforms, I'm giving you quick answers. In very important policy issues, I would never give quick votes, quick answers. I will research, I will take the time, I will study, I will invest. I've been investing, I wanna invest more. I want to take it to the next level. And thank you all, thank you, thank you, thank you. You all are good out there, and I appreciate you coming. Well, let's give a round of applause. <laughs> you really really wanted to ask or that you had in your mind that wasn't able to be asked today uh, I think I think Michael Blair I know where, where Blair is but he has a bag of pieces of paper uh, and I believe that what we can do is you know go talk to him he's around there he is Michael do you still have that bag oh okay great so this is the bag um, so we have some pieces of paper in here. If you have a question, come, come uh, hit up one of us, write it down, and we'll make sure that all the candidates get that. Uh, and maybe what we could do is have you guys answer that, just so that like, you know, there's even more answers for folks um, that we can share. Um, so, so also want to give a round of applause to our sponsors, St. Hope. <laughs> outside so they can start to clean up. Uh, again, we hope that you continue to engage with the Oak Park Neighborhood Association. Give to our Park Fairs program. And then our next meeting is on May 5th. This is an our April meeting. So come to our May meeting, guys. <laughs> Thank you.